Do you like my socks? I like my socks. Um, if you can't see, uh, they have Michelangelo's The David on them. Um, so today my socks are going to start off a bit of a story. So I got these socks at the Andy Warhol Museum. And as an artist, and especially as a Pittsburgh native, I'm a huge fan of Warhol, from his famous Campbell soup labels to his huge graphic prints of cows and Mao Zedong. Um, but I found I have an even stronger Andy Warhol connection than most people do. Uh, as I mentioned, we're both Pittsburgh-born artists. In fact, he grew up on the same street that my brother currently lives on in South Oakland. Uh, we're both the youngest of three brothers. Um, actually, his art teacher at Shenley High School was my mom's art teacher. And we have the same birthday, August 6th, give or take 69 years. Uh, but I also share a birthday with George Jung, a convicted drug felon, and Jerry Hollywell, popularly known as Ginger Spice. But I'm not here to talk to you today about drugs or the Spice Girls. I'm here to talk to you today about art and education. So one of the many great things about Andy Warhol was just how important education, especially education in the arts, was to him. His family grew up pretty poor. Uh, his parents both had to work two jobs each just to send Andy to college. He actually graduated high school at the age of 16, so he was extremely smart in addition to his more famously known um, creative genius. Um, however, shortly after he graduated high school, his dad passed away. But he put implicitly in his will that money was to be set aside to send Andy to CMU. So Andy Warhol was extremely fortunate to have um, people and a strong sense of education in his life especially in the arts, and that's what I want to talk to you about today, just how important art education is in developing a creative and innovative mind. So within each of us lie the seeds of creativity. Some have been more fortunate than others to have parents, teachers, or mentors who have helped nurture these seedlings of imagination into strong branches of creativity. As high schoolers, we know that successful students need to be prepared for their future with academic thinking, academic knowledge, and cognitive skills. But what we don't often think about is that we need problem-solving skills, innovative ideas, and creative thinking. Without creativity, there certainly would be no innovation. We've been taught that in life, problem-solving crosses multiple subject areas. And we're going to need to stretch our imaginations to approach different problems we're going to face every day in our future. The development of such a creative thinking occurs through valuing the arts and education. So there are tangible and less quantifiable benefits to an arts education. So let's look at a little research on the impact of arts education on cognitive development. So art education is practical for any high achieving school district. Art and music programs are actually mandatory in countries that rank consistently among the highest for those who score in math and science test scores. Uh, for example, Japan, Hungary, and the Netherlands. Researchers find that a sustained learning in music and theater correlated strongly with higher achievement in both math and reading. So here's a couple more statistics to mull over. A 2002 report by the Art Education looked at 62 separate studies from over 100 researchers and concluded that students who received more arts education did better on standardized tests, had improved social skills, or were more motivated than those who had little to no art education. In 2010, data from the Missouri Department of Education and the Missouri Alliance for Education in the Arts found that arts education had a significant effect on the academic and social success of their students. Those with great arts participation were more likely to participate in class, avoid being remo removed, and graduate. <coughs> Additionally, they demonstrated greater proficiency in mathematics and reading. Low-income students who had an arts-rich experience in high school were more than three times as likely to graduate with a BA than those students who didn't have that experience. So how exactly does this translate into a, a now STEM-focused world? Well, we've all used Google, right? Well, Google CEO Larry Page attributes his music education as a definite factor in his ability to succeed. I feel like music training led to the high-speed legacy of Google for me, said Page. Page played the saxophone, and he studied music composition in his youth. And when he was designing a program for a music synthesizer, he discovered a major weakness in computer and operating systems their inability to perform in real time. In music, you're very cognizant of time, said Page. If you're a percussionist, you hit something. It's got to happen in milliseconds. Like a percussionist, he became obsessed with response time. 
He predicted that the faster Google's search engine would return answers, the more it would be used. And clearly he was right. So that's one side of our brain thinking. Now let's look towards the left. When Poet and National Endowment for the Arts Chairman Donna Gioia uh, gave the 2007 commencement address at Stanford University, he used this opportunity as a way to promote the arts and make an argument for arts education. Quote, art is an irreplaceable way of understanding and expressing the world, said Gioia. There are some truths about life that can be expressed only as stories or songs or images. Art delights, instructs, consoles. It educates our emotions. Studying the arts, be it music, visual arts, drama, or dance, can open our eyes to ideas that are at the core of human existence since the beginning of time. You cannot touch art without touching values. Values about love, work, family, beauty, ugliness, war, and peace. Absolutely, studying the arts can help boost math scores and increase proficiency in language skills, but we should study arts because they're at the core of human existence. There are other less tangible results of arts education. Drama, music, and visual arts have been found to increase self-confidence for all students. Participating in these creative pursuits helps students to have confidence in the ability to do things well and be successful. This has been especially true from students who come from disadvantaged backgrounds. In a short while, we're gonna hear a TED Talk from Ken Robinson, who is a leader and really pushes for uh, the movement of arts education. And in his uh, book, The Element, he opens up with this really great story. So there's this uh, drawing class, and this teacher is teaching this cl drawing class to six-year-olds. And there's a little girl in the back, and normally throughout all the other classes, she's really quiet, she doesn't participate, she's very shy. Uh, but during drawing class, she, she's always participating. So this one day during drawing class, the teacher gives out the assignment, and the students are working. And this little girl's in the back, like arms over her paper, scribbling really hard. And so the teacher's just like, she's ecstatic. She's like, okay, this student is finally participating. She's really enjoying it. She looks really confident back there. So the teacher goes to the back and she says, oh, oh honey, what are you working on? And the little girl looks up and she says, uh, I'm drawing a picture of God. And so the teacher was a little surprised, a little taken aback. She was like, oh, well, no one really knows what God looks like. And the little girl looks up and says, they will in a minute. So it's kind of a funny story, but it, it carries a great reminder. Kids are so confident in their imaginations. I'm, I'm a member of the National Art Honor Society. And as a member, uh, myself and other students, we go to lots of different community events, especially in the elementary schools, uh, to do art with kids. And when you give a six-year-old a uh, pack of crayons and a uh, winter-themed coloring page, you don't get back like a detailed por uh, portrait of Elsa from Frozen. Uh, more often than not, I've had the pleasure of watching students take this coloring page or construct their crafts in really non-conventional ways. And I love that there's always a story that goes along with it, like why their snowman is green and why he has two carrots for eyes instead of the traditional black holes. Yet when we continue on our education, this creativity so alive in our very young is often lost or even repressed. A uh, purple cat or this green snowman is no longer logical. And God must be drawn as an old man with a big beard and billowing robes. However, through arts education, this creativity can be kept alive or even rekindled. So let's look at a little more research. Students in art programs develop a greater uh, ability to work as members of a team and hone their communication and collaboration skills. Studies have shown that a development of deeper levels of culture and deeper understanding of other people's perspectives as a result of arts education. Students develop greater group awareness and mutual respect, while at the same time learning to express their individuality within their group. The arts encourage us to explore ideas, take risks, open our hearts and minds, express ourselves and support others in a positive way, developing the human spirit, social skills, and intellectual abilities. So what's the impact of arts in my life? As a senior soon leaving the rich educational environment at Baldwin High School, I'm ready to move forward and begin college. My plan is to combine my love of sciences with my love of art and science, uh, with my love of art uh, and study both chemistry and studio art in college. So is this an odd combination? People already give me this like really weird look when I say I want to study chemistry, let alone pairing it with art. But while most don't immediately pair the two together, I find that they're really intertwined. Um, 
Chemistry is an art. Each atom arranged at precise angles to create the final sculpture, the molecule. Art is chemical, the molecules in paint interacting with each other to create a myriad of colors in the artist's painting. For me, chemistry deals primarily with the quantitative and analytical, while art is more expressive and emotional, but I oftentimes find that they really overlap. So during my studies here at Baldwin, the education I've received in the arts will make me a better scientist, more engaged student, and more importantly, a creative thinker. So how exactly am I applying this creativity uh, to what I want to do in the future? Um, I said I'm interested in studying chemistry, but more specifically, I really want to look at green chemistry. Um, a side note, uh, Rachel Carson, the P Pittsburgh activist, sparked the green movement and really pushed um, and opened up new ideas about these uh, new different chemical reactions and green processes. Um, but in this relatively new field of green chemistry, uh, researchers will look at traditional chemical reactions, oftentimes used in industry, and fi find ways to make them more environmentally friendly. Or they'll look at totally new ideas, totally new problems, and find creative solutions that are green um, and low energy. That, for example, um, looking at water pollution in uh, underprivileged nations that they've developed um, low energy carbon filtration. So green chemistry is a field that really requires you to be creative. Um, you've got to be creative to look at this process that we've been doing for years and find an entirely different way to go about it. Or you look at a totally new problem and you have to find a, find a really creative green solution to solve it. So it's not left brain, it's not right brain, it's whole brain. I love to express myself through the stroke of a brush or the line of a pencil, and I love to challenge myself to be innovative. I believe that by growing as an artist, I'm evolving into a more creative thinker, which has really spilled over into my passion for chemistry. And I fully expect that I'm going to be a better citizen of the world, more mature, and more passionate due to my arts education. So do you know the real name of my birthday twin? No, not Ginger Spice. Andy Warhol was actually born Andy Warhalla. When he moved to New York in the 1950s to start his career, he dropped the A at the end of his last name. A is a letter we need to bring back into the picture. As Rhode Island Institute of Design suggests, let's heat up STEM and make it STEAM. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Andy Warhol, Google CEO Larry Page, and even first graders encountering their first art project have all taught us something. That we need to teach ourselves to be more creative thinkers and to educate a new generation of learners that are ready to approach any problem with a creative twist. Thank you.